Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Nassina, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as uh, we discuss a very important topic during Mental Health Awareness Month, we are going to be talking about Black women's mental health awareness, um, Black people in general, Black women specifically. And today, there's a lot of feedback somewhere. Norman, is that you, our producer? All right, well, today I'm going to continue with the introduction. Um, but today we have two of my favorite people, uh, Dr. Stephanie, Stephanie Evans. Dr. Stephanie Evans is the professor of Black Women's Studies and serves as director of the Institute of um, or for Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Georgia State University. And uh, she is the co editor of the book, Black Women's Mental Wellness or Black Men, Men, Women's Mental Health Balancing Strength and Vulnerability, a book co-edited by Dr. Kanika Bell, one of our guests who's here all the time, uh, and me. So that is our book that we wrote together. Of course, you all know Dr. Kanika Bell. She is here quite often. I guess my am going over. I don't know what's happening today. <laughs> but uh, she is uh, maybe it was me. quite often, and um, we are happy to have you. Dr. Kanika Bell is the author of numerous articles. She's an associate professor at Clark Atlanta University, and um, she is actually a practicing clinical psychologist. Um, you've also seen her on other shows where she provides commentary, particularly for TV One and shows you might see on Discovery or uh, uh, um, or IDTV or things of that nature. So welcome, uh, Kanika Bell. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So today and we're going to have a conversation. We're really um, good friends. So that's just full disclosure. Uh, so we'll probably fall into like girlfriend land um, and you'll see all that black girl magic y'all keep talking about. And um, we'll lose all of our SAT words that, made that, that we can learn in order to get our PhDs. And we'll try not to cuss because we're not drinking. So that helps. That helps. Um, <laughs> we'll try not to uh, use any words that we shouldn't. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to when we're not speaking and when we are speaking, um, we will um, um, unmute. Yeah, I think that's helpful. All right, so we are uh, solving these technical issues. We haven't been doing this for a couple of weeks, so we're a little bit rough, but we'll be back. Um, we'll be back to our, our normal standards. And uh, at any rate, uh, this month is Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, you have seen lots of people talking about it. Um, there's actually been, I think, an uptick of uh, people interested in black people's mental health, particularly surrounding all of this trauma um, that we're experiencing most recently. We're looking at the video of Ronald Green, um, who was uh, killed by police and we're finding out that he was traumatized and uh, really uh, beaten uh, badly and tased uh, before all of that happened. Um, and that, that uh, footage was just released. Um, and so, you know, I was talking to my mother today um, I was talking to my mother today and my mother said, I just hate turning on the television because it's just all black trauma. It's us being mistreated by the police. It's um, Nicole Hannah Jones being denied tenure at UNC, which, you know, these are, are not equal in terms of weight, um, but they are significant in terms of how they impact black people. And when, you know, uh, Dr. Jones um, doesn't get tenure, then those people like us, um, you know, black uh, academics and black women, that does impact you when you see someone who's done such great work be denied something um, that has been given to uh, people who have been less than stellar and who have had no credentials. And many, and oftentimes people who make those decisions don't even have the credentials that you have when they're making these decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, let's talk about A, why mental health awareness is important, particularly as it relates to our communities. And then B, how do we deal with um, this trauma from all aspects of life um, that we continue to see and experience as black people in uh, white America? I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> You start us off, lady. Start us off. You know, obviously, I'm a psychologist, so I'm going to say that the most important thing for us to pay attention to is mental health um, and our mental health awareness. But I say that because it so largely impacts all of our other health dynamics. You know, the reason why we are well, besides kind of just gaps in in um, in in government spending and and health disparities and things like that, some of our issues, right, related to our physical health. Has 
ha really have a direct relationship to our mental health, right? Mm -hmm. Our um, our chronic exposure to to trauma, as we were talking about, whether it's in our neighborhoods or whether it's on television while we are watching something, you know, absolutely disturbing, like someone who looks like us being murdered by the police. Whatever those things are, are related to our experience of hypertension. They're related to our experience of diabetes. We use food to cope with psychological trauma. And so because those things are all interrelated, it is so important to take some time out for our mental health. And I think as a community, we've been so used to applying stigma um, to the pursuit of care of our mental health and just flat out ignoring it is the first thing to go. I'm too busy to you know, take care of myself. Self-care sounds luxurious and wonderful. That's something white women do. It's not something for us. Whatever those ideas are. And I really just- white women and me. Okay, go right. ahead. <laughs> right. And all of we, we have completely um, gotten away from what I think used to be our thing though. I actually think when you look at traditional societies, I feel like self-care and taking care of the psyche and the soul was a thing. You know, yeah. how did we get, you know, to to this environment in this country and suddenly it is no longer our thing? Right, right, exactly. Dr. Evans. All right, all right. Well, it's a challenge because we've got historical trauma. So we're dealing with the now. We're dealing with police killings, attacks on reproductive health. Uh, Palestine, uh, COVID, we still are in a pandemic, even though, I mean, the CDC said, but you know, <laughs> I'm just saying uh, I have doubts and I have mm -hmm. questions. So there's all of these things that are happening now, but they're compounded by historical trauma. So we have to look at these traumas now and understand that we've carried these traumas historically and the anxieties mm -hmm. that come with dealing with the future. You know, we're we're in higher education and I'm a I'm a department chair. I've been a department chair for 11 years. So for my position, I'm looking at fall, I'm already in fall and summer of next year in terms of planning. And when we're talking about reopening after COVID and, you know, we're teaching in I teach in black studies and women's studies and these are um, these are areas that are attacked in the not only in the academy, but for what they're exposing in the community and in the world. And so there's all of this that that happens that builds on each other. And so that's just the personal kind of perspective and the historical perspective. But, you know, what's happening in our family, definitely what's happening in our community and the nation and national politics, the triggers are daily. Mm -hmm. and so it's just it's a it's a real challenge to take a step back. But um, as Dr. Bell said, it's imperative that, you know, so I just came up with like what I know we'll get to the what do we do part, but just pausing for a moment, just the ability to breathe in and out for one moment is sometimes more terrifying than trying to deal with everything that's going on at once right mm -hmm. and so that's 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 the hardest thing to do is just as sonia sanchez says pause mm -hmm. because because we do feel so overwhelmed with all of these different challenges yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, you all raise a great point. And uh, David Kelly says, thank you for addressing this issue. I'm not crazy, but racism can make a wise person surely act like it. Okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, crazy can be catching. Mm. But um, can we talk a little bit about that? This idea of um, this intense racism and sexism that we face as something of a mental disorder in and of itself and what that looks like as a person, uh, I hate the term person of color, but as a black person, <laughs> I don't even know what to say, but as black people, because we're talking about black people. <laughs> um, but as a black person, um, you know, what that means or what that looks like um, in certain ways. Um, can we talk about that a little bit? Like this whole idea of uh, racism as a, a form of mental illness or, or sexism as a form of mental illness and real world and offer real world examples of what that looks like. I mean, clearly these isms are public health emergencies. I mean, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They may not call them that, 
Mm -hmm. but it's violence. You know what I mean? It is just violence. And we have been reared historically, as Dr. Evans said, in this kind of culture of violence. And then we graduate these, these sometimes maladaptive coping strategies onto future generations for dealing with this violence. Right. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm part of a, um, a, a group that that talks about and this is this is a touchy subject. Right. Kind of um, black parents over reliance on corporal punishment on children. And, and I actually did some research about that, like where that hails from. You know, why are we so you know, we just go straight to the spanking. Right? That literally comes from this idea of we have to train our children to cope with racism. You can't be disrespectful ever. You can't step outside of your boundaries. You must stay within this square or circle lest you be killed by somebody who is threatened by your intellectual prowess. And mm -hmm. so then we thwart it violently in our own children. Now you're talking about a mental illness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> you're talking about an ongoing yes. mental illness. Yes, absolutely. Dr. And, Evans. And it's hard not to feel crazy as a black woman because everything, not only as, as Dr. Bell said, are we conditioned to um, ignore our first mind, right? And to ignore our gut when it's some like, girl, that's not right, <laughs> you know, but we're conditioned to do that. But anytime we do step out and challenge authority, challenge um, or call out blatant hypocrisies, like you, it, it just makes you feel crazy. Like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. am I just, Okay, so I thought the bar was here, but oh, y'all no. just go move the goalpost. And then they say, no, we didn't move the goalpost. You moved. You're crazy. And that, you know, that term gaslighting comes from, you know, that idea that, you know, you're trying to the abuser and the people who are who are violent are trying mm -hmm. to make you think, you know, in, in whatever form that takes that you're not actually seeing what you're saying, seeing or feeling what you're feeling. So as a black woman, it's really hard not to feel crazy. So I think one of the first uh, one of the first um, presentations that we gave together, Kanika, I don't know if you remember this, but I titled it Loving All the Voices Inside of My Head. That's right. right? It was like, because usually when you hear like voices inside your head, that's not necessarily. <laughs> but the thing that made me feel sane was black women studies. Reading mm -hmm. Black women's histories, Black women's life stories, Black women's theory, Black, and it's not just merely representational politics because Black women are not just a monolith, right? There's all sorts mm -hmm. of against the uh, around the political uh, rainbow and all sorts of you know the the ideological rainbow, the cultural rainbow, the experience. Like there's a whole bunch of different types of ways to be a Black woman. But the thing that made me feel sane was reading a whole bunch of Black women talking to a whole bunch of black women. So you see mm -hmm. the spectrum and then you get to see how it's not just about identity, right? Um, and, and, and people misuse a lot of black women's ideas like um, Barbara Smith's um, identity politics, right. or Crenshaw's intersectionality, they don't even know, or uh, no, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it's, really, um, it's really easy to feel crazy when you see, you know, when as black people we're faced with structural violence and we're told that it's not there. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have uh, Dr. Daniel Black who loves you all. He said it, in fact, the brilliant oh. part of the game. Um, although he shouted out you specifically, Dr. Evans and Dr. Bell, I know you're talking about me too, Danny. So, <laughs> um, why do y'all share that special bond? And he's a king. Yeah. And if you want to read about these issues too? He writes about this a lot and has wonderful poetry as well that's as other types of books. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. I also have a, a, a commenter who uh, is saying that um, gaslighting includes other people, including black, um, which we're not saying that it doesn't. Um, and so as we uh, focus our discussion today, uh, we are focusing on black people in general, black women specifically, 
Um, and just because we are focusing our discussion on um, looking at uh, systems of um, discrimination and white supremacy and all of that, and we do know uh, as scholars and human beings that some of that is internalized, right? We call it internalized right. oppression, internalized bias, all of that self-loathing. Um, there are like a whole bunch of pejorative terms we have for uh, to describe black people with black with issues um, in those spaces. Um, so please know that we're not um, disqualifying what you're saying or suggesting that it is only something that's being done to us by um, a, a larger system of domination or oppression, oppression based on white supremacist ideologies and ways of thinking and being and behaviors that are rewarded. Um, oh, girl, I said rewarded like I was from somewhere else. <laughs> um, rewarded. Look, I'm from Virginia, y'all. We're rewarded. We say rewarded. We say it just like that. Um, but people are, are being rewarded for punishing uh, Black people in general and Black women specifically in this particular discussion and what that looks like from a mental health perspective. So we just want to stay focused on us for the purposes of this show. And we're not leaving out self-loathing Black people. Um, I'm sure they're watching and we're probably hearing from them right now on social media. Um, but just know yeah, that we're kicking some good comments about that because I, I thought about that too when we were talking about it too. Is mm -hmm. this true the gaslighting that 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 takes place within community? Mm -hmm. if black women are saying, I smell massage noir on the menu, and mm -hmm. they're being told, No, it no, it isn't. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes I even say, Do you hear yourself? You know, like I was, I saw a big discussion about um, women being told to smile, black women, especially in workplaces, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, your brothers are like, why is that deep? Oh my gosh, just smile. I was like, I just want you to picture walking around and white men being like, smile, go ahead and smile. Hey, mm -hmm. boy, smile. <laughs> what would your response be to that? Wouldn't you feel minimized, childlike? Wouldn't you feel like that was an act of aggression, kind of a passive aggressive racism? That's how. <laughs> sometimes we feel like smiling and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't want to be just ornaments. I just want to walk into the Publix <laughs> right, and not have to perform in some particular way, lest be called uh, the names that I know my mama did not name me. So these are like also things that black women then have to carry. Dr. Black said too in his comment about um, why, why can't we talk about black women? Why, 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 why do we, uh, no matter what the discussion is, well, what about black men? So we just talking about black women and breast cancer. We get it too. Okay. At some, at a percentage. All right. But we can't just talk like it's never okay to mm -hmm. just have a space to discuss things that are pertaining to black women. And I think black men shouldn't opt out of those discussions, be part of the discussion and let's all talk about things that impact black women. Right. Right. But yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. And um, we have, I mean, there is so much discussion about massage noir. And for people who don't know what that is, Dr. Bell, can you can you define it, please? Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> that is that's the same concept as misogyny, women hating, women, women um, minimizing, ignoring the plight of women, gaslighting women when they say that sexism exists, but it's specifically at the intersection of being black and woman. That's right. That's right. So um as we talk about this. I mean, what do you think? Because, you know, the other day, um, since, you know, these are my girls, this is my crew. Um, the other day, I was, I was at the, uh, I was getting some service done on my, on my car. And um, Stephanie, can you mute real quick? Are you muted? Okay. Muted. Um, so I was doing some work on my car and I was getting some work done on my car. And um, there was an older white woman, um, and she, when I say older, like 90. And I was surprised she was out by herself. She probably wasn't that old because she was mobile, more mobile than that, but she looked old, duh. And um, this brother came in and I was sitting there waiting for my car. And he said, hey, how are you to me? And I said, hi, hi I'm, I'm well having to spend this money on this car, <laughs> but as well as I can be. And then uh, she said, well, you didn't say hi to me, young man. So I was like, oh, she doesn't read for comprehension but she's like a thousand years old. So I'm not gonna be um, mean to her or respond to her in the way that I would someone who should like reasonably know. And she probably should if she read for comprehension. Prior to this, she had asked to turn off the television um, and she asked me to turn off television even though I wasn't watching it. Um, I said, yeah, I'm not watching it. So do what you want, I don't care. So I was already trying to be nice. Like I'm trying to not fight everywhere, right? Uh, especially when I got right whole checks right at the end of it. 
So um, I just want to get in my car and get out of here, right? Um, so then this happens with the gentleman. So then I'm like, okay, am I being overly sensitive? This goes back to the voices in your head, Stephanie. I said, am I being overly sensitive? Or is this lady, excuse me, I almost cussed, um, out of her damn mind and trying to like get me to like do something, like say something to her. Um, and so finally the last straw was, uh, and this is all within like a 30 minute period. I'm literally waiting for my Uber. Y'all know I'm a germaphobe. So I'm, I'm already on high uh, anxiety because I got to get into an Uber in a, in a pandemic. Right. Um, so I can get to work. And the woman says, uh, I, I read a text from somebody and I laugh and I'm like, <laughs> and she says, are you laughing at me? And so then I was like, no, I'm not laughing at you. And I would like you to leave me out of your internal dialogue. And she looked at me and I said, do not say another word to me, please. I said, I'm trying to be nice to you. But I said, you have overstepped your bounds more than once. This is the third and last time. My mother used to tell me three strikes, you're out. I said, you're out. And her strike was on the second. You, I'm going to give you the third. I said, don't say nothing else to me. And I meant it. Um, and so then the other people in the place were looking at me like, oh, my God, you're being mean to this old white woman. And I'm looking at him like, oh, my God, y'all letting this white woman disrespect me <laughs> and this brother that's in here. And I'm not the crazy one. She's crazy. You know, so when we think about these, the ways in which this works and what it looks like and when you're in your head and when you're not being backed up or supported or when you're trying to just be just be. Or as Stephanie says, breathe. Or as we say in our book, many people in our book who wrote, who contributed. And our book has uh, 21 contributors. So it's not just us. So if we bore you today, you still read the book. Um, it came out in 2017. We're not getting no coins on it. <laughs> You'll find some other amazing voice uh, like Shaniqua Walker Barnes, who is amazing um, and under attack constantly in social media. Um, but you'll find some other fantastic people um, who write about these things. But really, it's like that everyday, um, covert, uh, passive aggressive behavior that we're just supposed to tolerate forever. And I'm not with that. I mean, where are y'all on it? Well, so I have to shout out Moya Bailey, who coined who was uh, coined the term massage noir. Yeah. And her and her book comes out in five days, and I'm just waiting you know, waiting for this, um, talking about massage noir and, um, and digital spaces, right? So it's literally the, the hatred of Black women, right? The hatred of Blackness compounded with the hatred of women and how that plays out in uh, waiting rooms for while you're, you know, your car, in classrooms, in policy, in you know in all of these different areas and so um that's why i started studying mental health because i started off you know researching black women's intellectual history so i've i, I love books i've always been a geek and so i started looking at black women particularly in higher education and 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 um legacies of what it means to learn, what it means to know, you know, these 25 cent words, epistemology, all of those different types of things, but to know particularly from the perspective of a black woman, right? And it just, again, made me look at the world in a different way to recognize the ways that these are actually, you know, there's there's a term microaggressions. These are not microaggressions when they're, they're not interpersonal individual incidences. These are systemic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And when we say systemic, what do we mean by that? We mean um, micro, meso, macro, global, right? This happens, the internal dialogues that we have with ourselves, interpersonally with our family, our community, our churches, our, our mosques, our, um, our schools, our work, and then nationally in every policy level, any, any, if any time we are trying to get a license, any time we are trying to um, just walk, breathe, live, laugh, learn, all of the things that black people have gotten persecuted for by police officers or random bystanders, right? So, yeah. the, 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 so it's cultural as well as political, as well as legal, um, the legal systems, the, the injustice systems, the school systems that perpetuate this outside of the home, and then globally, how we see what's happening, for example, in um, 
in Palestine and Israel and mm -hmm. what's happening globally in terms of the, the where the um, sympathies lie, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. how, how phrases, particularly um, in the public space, whether it's social media or journalism, how, who are the sympathetic characters? Who gets the benefit of the doubt? You know, the, the, the discussion of the January 6th insurrection and attack. Right, mm -hmm. on the capital in democracy. Who gets the benefit of the doubt? Who gets to have a second and third and eighth and ninth chance and have issues swept under the rug? That that mm -hmm. disproportionate um, impact or extra, what I call extraordinary scrutiny. Those are the things that uh, that's that's what I mean by systemic. All that. All right. right. Exactly. Thank you. Um, and it's exhausting. So yeah, it is exhausting, right? So, I mean, even you you mentioned it the out. Yes, which leads us um, directly to a question from a viewer who's talking about um, a question about cognitive dissonance, dissonance um, and uh, weaponized by those who control the justice system, right? Uh, if the truth sets us free, then why doesn't the white, uh, why don't the white supremacists who control society recognize their bondage? So his question is, we know this is happening. This is systemic on multiple levels. If we look at the criminal justice system and all that is happening, most recently was Ronald Green and probably 10 other people yesterday, right? That we'll find out about two years from now when the body cam video is uh, is released uh, to the public or for public consumption. Mm -hmm. um, but when we think about all of those things, how is it that um, people who engage in these types of practices, um, people who are empowered in this way based on white supremacy are unable to see that that is also a type of bondage? Their esteem is too wrapped up in it. Any, anyone operating in supremacy, mm -hmm. right? Anybody who is maintaining a supremacist, you know, a, a, a platform is, only looking at what their immediate benefits are from it, right? Their esteem is so built in maintaining power and control over an assumed person who would be beneath them. The idea is if we don't maintain that power, this, this group rises, recognizes their power, and then we would have to answer some serious questions about ourselves. That's just entirely too damaging, I think, for the psyche. So there's this part you know, I, mean, I just think it's 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 a lot more subconscious than we even think it is. There's just like this motivation to hold on. Look how many people vote against their own best interests to maintain white supremacy. Like mm -hmm. the a, a good number of people who are voting out here. And I'm thinking, you don't even know you're voting against your own best interests. Well, I don't think we should get rid of Obamacare. You're on it. <laughs> I'm not. Really. I mean, I'm like, but, but these but many poor white folks that have said, yes. I'm trying to get rid of Obamacare. I'm like, what, what's your insurance company? You're on Obamacare. You're on it. You don't even know that that's what, because it's not called Obamacare. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? As a health professional, we're not billing Obamacare. It's not called that. It has these other names. You own it and don't even know that. You are operating against your own best interests. You are going to be damaged by policies that you are supporting because you have so much fear of the possibility that whiteness won't reign supreme. That's right. <laughs> that you'd right. rather shoot your own self in the foot for fear okay. that whiteness won't reign supreme. And so, I mean, look at, you talking about mental illness. I feel like that's mm -hmm. my statement for today. You talking about mm -hmm. mental illness. <laughs> So what about, <laughs> Anika, what about, so in the same way, um, when you talk about massage noir and so, you know, some of the things, especially in social media, oh wow, the way that some of our men come after us, um, and this is getting back to Kwanda's, um, uh, Scott, Scott, Scott Ford's comment about how people want to tell us what to think, how to be, and what to do. Why do you think black, some of our black men, um, not the ones watching and celebrating us. Um, and you don't always have to watch or celebrate us. We are not above for reproach or critique. But um, how some of our Black men are so hateful um, towards us and would rather align with people who even oppress them mm -hmm. than uplift us through policies and things of that nature. Um, why is that, Dr. Bell? I think same motivation, same thing. Right. There is something in white supremacy. I even think when we talked about we talked about this before, like black men voting for Trump, they admire him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They admire him, even though he hates them back. 
There's mm -hmm. something you admire. There's a machismo. There's something that he wields, his ability to grab women in the P-U-S-S wise. You know what I'm saying? Like this mm -hmm. is somehow there's some admiration of that. And and again, it's been presented to us as the most as the most grand thing, right? Whiteness and white supremacy. And so they're closer to it. They can get a little snippet of it, right? By subjugating their own women. And I just think that's part of it. Because when you really look at things statistically, when you see these things that happen on social media, you know, black women are gold diggers, couldn't be possible. Could it be possible? Most of us, I, and you look statistically in terms of earnings, you know, compared to black men, black women are the most loyal demographic group. You know what I'm saying? Mo almost 90% of us date within race dating black men, you know, exclusively those of us who date men. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's mm -hmm. not possible, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But these tropes continue because you feel, so, I think that is part of it. Feeling oppressed by the other group makes people want to oppress. Right, pedagogy Who's left? Right. Right. That's right. what who, who's left? he talks about. Like, to right. carry this burden. I can't go off on my supervisor at work. I can't allow, you know what I mean? I can't allow myself to have these moments where I, I react um, emotionally in those places. So I'm going to dump those feelings on the place where I think that I can. Right. Yeah. And I, um, I'm, I'm loving everything that you said. And I, uh, I was talking over you. Sorry, I was hijacking the conversation. No, no, no. Problem. We're so, so in a discussion. Mm -hmm. But when you said it, I was thinking Paolo Fryer, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, mm -hmm. writes about, you know, the problem, why we can't uh, ever get free is because we're always trying to oppress somebody else. And you yep. can't be free yep. if you're trying to hold somebody else down, um, which yep. I think is the answer to both David and uh, Quanda's, uh, Quanda's statements and uh, David's question. Um, so when we think about um, all of these things that Black people are kind of absorbing on a regular and everyday basis. And then we think about, because, you know, I found it fascinating um, that Mental uh, Health Awareness Month is May. And this is like Mother's Day month, right? And I was thinking about all the people who've lost mothers, right? I was thinking about all the people who are mothers who've lost children. Mm. I was thinking about all the mothers who uh, may have um, estranged or strained um relationships with their children. I was thinking about all the women um, who wanted to be, who want to be moms. Like, you know, there's a time when I wanted to be a mom, I was not a mom. So Mother's Day, I was just like, oh, I'm not gonna ever have a Mother's Day, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but all the women who want to be moms and are not mothers. Um, and what that looks like in this particular moment, like how does that affect one's psyche? Um, and what does that look like as it relates to black women in general, but black mothers uh, specifically, especially with all of the loss that so many people have suffered or experienced um, during this COVID uh, and pandemic mm -hmm. situation? Um, before, before we move on to the question of mother mental health and loss, um, I wanted to weigh in on the question of white uh, supremacy and patriarchy. Um, you know, Nell, Nell Painter, Nell Irvin Painter wrote a book called History of White People. And as, an, as a historian, she just unpacked the development of whiteness and the embedding of um, systemic supremacy, right? Um, and, and so before we get to understand what it means to be anti-racist or um, what even feminism means or womanism means and how those are vilified, um, just the concept of, of claiming equal humanity. Mm -hmm. It's helpful to look at, um, at the, cons the, the social and historical construction of these ideas and the history of white people covers just everything. Like how did, how did white people become um, what we know as white people and how can we not dehumanize white people or dehumanize black men, but also I clearly identify and call out what is, you know, what what are these things? And then when we again talk about the intersection, there's this book, uh, But Some of Us Are Brave, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave. Um, that was mm -hmm. a foundational text of what we call Black Women's Studies that mm -hmm. really helps us understand that it's we do sit, as Anna Julia Cooper wrote, at a particular intersection, right? And she wrote this in 1892 in a book called um, 
a, a voice from the South by a black woman of the South. And so we, we start to kind of understand if we're talking about black women, we're talking about white supremacy built into his you know systems, patriarchy, and that Dr. Bell talked about that, that proximity to power that you know that is very alluring and very attractive mm -hmm. and how that works in in all different ways that you know if we could just uplift and be elite if we just wore pearls if we just pulled up our pants we you know if we just all of these things um <laughs> but but we really we have to unpack we have to unpack all of these things and um and then we can also understand how region impacts how personal experiences, if, as you were talking about, and I'm kind of getting back into this, what does it mean to commemorate a month? What, what does it mean to commemorate? I would even add Mother's Day. And for, for people like me who are begin, beginning to speak out a little bit more, um, who uh, have had a miscarriage, um, what that means, what it means to be different types of configurations mm -hmm. of mothers, and you know the the stigma the stigma of being a black mother, much less a black single mother. Mm -hmm. right? All of these different types of assumptions and 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 real challenges and real burdens. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> That's what we should subtitle this episode. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. I S S A. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. What do you thoughts, Dr. Bell? Um, you know, I think this, it, I, I'm not sure I ever put it all together, like Mental Health Awareness Month being in May and that being kind of, and Mother's, I never really thought about that. You know, when you were talking, I was like, hmm, what a time to kind of think about that. I always think about, I do think about friends who have either lost mothers or had um, what they would consider an unsuccessful unsuc journey towards motherhood. I think about that during during this mother, Mother's Day time, I remember being that woman and then kind of miraculously being on the other side of, of Mother's Day, you know, becoming, mm -hmm. um, becoming a mother, not knowing for sure, you know, if I was, if I was going to get um, to that side, lots of trying, lots of, you know, uh, you know, other issues at hand. And so I never really thought about that, but I think that somehow, I think it's the reason why I think it's so impactful for black women, especially is that we're always considered kind of the mother of the community. You know what I mean? We've always been expected to mother other folks. Like mm -hmm. part of why that woman was asking you to change the television and whatnot, because Miss Millie didn't understand why <laughs> you didn't work for her. You know what I'm saying? Like you're supposed to be in service to me. Come on, mammy, and do my bidding. You know, like it was just, I mean, it was it came so naturally. And for her to still have that in 2021, you know, what I mean, still these kind of ideas and these archetypes about black women and motherhood being such a strong part of it, so much that we judge one another at times. You know, you're not a mother. Like that's the thing, you know, what yeah. I mean, that defines, you know, your personhood and whatnot. And so for us to to have to deal with that. You know what I mean? It's certainly going to be a mental health challenge. And what about women who are like, yeah, I'm not interested in actually being a mother. I mean, yes. thanks. Yes. And that person being pathologized, like, oh, you're just in pain. Every <laughs> woman, especially a black woman, wants to be married with 17 children. Just of course you do. <laughs> and you know, that that belief then trying to put mental health, you know, <laughs> um, challenges on somebody who's feeling fine. Right, you right. living fancy, free, and feeling fine. So, I, you know, I never really thought about that. That this is the month that we look at mental health, and this is also the month that, for many women, are struggling even on the other side of motherhood, not necessarily being recognized. You know, I was talking to my friends, and I was like, you know what, you know, what we're doing next year for Mother's Day, we gonna plan it ourselves. We're going to do something to celebrate ourselves mm -hmm. because I think we wait around and say, who's going to celebrate us? Okay, nobody. Perfect. You know what I'm saying? My child's too young to do something big. You know, so I was just on Mother's Day, like, okay. I mean, you know, people are like, how your Mother's Day? I was, I was like shopping for stuff and taking care of a child. So, you know, it was there was nothing particular. I mean, you know, I was celebrating my own mama and my own grandmother, but I was like, hmm. Yeah, I was cleaning up. So I need to do it. Yeah, I'm a dude. I did two of the laundry. So I realize now that that's something like it's in May, just like we're telling people to take care of your mental health. Take care of yourself on Mother's Day, mother or not. 
You yes. know what I'm saying? Tradi yes. By traditional time. This is a time, a month, and then of course a day and a weekend. I think for women to take stock in the kind of care we have shown other people and decide that we're going to show that care to ourselves. Yes, absolutely. And to also then recognize that this, you know, for me, the the convergence of um the, the, the dual pandemics of COVID and racism. Huh. I can't, you know, I think about my loss of, you know, not having, um, not being able to have a child, right? But I think more about what would it be like to have a child and then have that child murdered in the street, mm -hmm. you know, and, or be taken out. You know, we've lost 3 million people in this world. Three, and we just walk around now like, oh, you know, the CDC said so we don't need no masks. Mm -hmm. So what happens, you know, to those mothers who have oh, lost their, have you know, to to uh, lost their children to COVID? Mm -hmm. you no, know, because we were not warned, we were not protected, you know, by policy, by you know, sane science and adherence to. So it's like I said, it's it's a lot, but. This particular year has really made me money. I don't know. You know me. I'm an introvert. I'm an empath. I feel everything, which is why I have to limit my media, my mm -hmm. social media and my interaction with, with human beings on everything because I'm just like, I I feel it, though. Yeah. And so you have to just, you know, you can't, you know, but I, I grieve for mothers who have lost in this past mm -hmm. year in, in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I feel you. And um, Kwanda um, says that she was doing laundry on Mother's Day, <laughs> but she also sure. said as a former foster parent and now adoptive and single mom. Um, and I'm an adoptive mom, Kwanda. I'm actually, an, I call myself an only parent, which I got from my spesh, my, my very good friend and soror who um, adopted before me um, and adopted as a single person. So we're actually only parents because there there is no one coming to pick up the baby. Um, mm -hmm because there is not a father. There's no one to argue with custody over. There are not other sets of grandparents unless we put them in their lives. And luckily, you know, I've, I've done that. Kai has a bonus dad. She has bonus grandparents. She has all of that. And she has real grandparents too. Um, real meaning um, my parents are still living, thank God. Um, and even I have a grandmother who's still living who's crazy about her as well. But my point is, um, and what Ka 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 uh, Kwanda was saying is that, um, you know, some of the things that you have to do is to acknowledge. And I think there's power in that word, acknowledging um, that it's a tough time or acknowledging that this is happening or going on. And we have to do that for each other and to each other. So we have to be mindful of how we engage with one another. Um, and, and uh, you know, like when people, even though I'm, I love my daughter's uh, biological mother or birth mother, um, you know, people will be like, they talk about her as the mother and me as just like some lady who just picked her up off the street. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, oh, no, no, yeah, uh, uh, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> I'm with her every day. I got her. Patterson, she was six hours old. Right. She, you know, um, but even that kind of stuff that I mean, you know, it's not meant to cause anguish or anything. And it really doesn't. I just let it roll. But it happens quite a bit as if I'm just kind of like this surrogate who's standing in for this other person. It's like, no, I am the person. Um, and uh, even though I love her and we love each other and we have a great um, relationship, um, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, I'm not her mom. Um, so even that kind of stuff, which leads me to um, this next part, um, which is solutions, right? Um, we have about 15 minutes left in the show. So if you have questions, you should be sending them. Um, but let's talk about the uh, solutions. Um, I know, Stephanie, you have a new book out, um, Black Women's uh, Yoga History. And uh, tell us a little bit about um, some of the solutions that Black people in general um, and Black women specifically can do to really kind of deal with this really onslaught of, uh, I call it terror and trauma, <laughs> that we face all day long, every day um, in the world. It's not in this, just in this country, but in the world. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, before I get to talking about Black women's yoga history, I'll just call your attention to uh, Dr. Bell's chapter in this book, which is the first <laughs> chapter, where um, Dr. Bell <laughs> surveyed 50, 50, five zero Black women mental health professionals. So this is uh, therapists, social workers, counselors, and they came up with a list. It's not a definitive list. Again, Black women are not um, hom uh, homogenous, but it's helpful to gather information and research. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's actually, I, you know, I started again um, 
looking at ideas and and move to ideas about self-care and how that is played out in history right and and so the first step was kind of understanding what professionals black women mental health professionals say and then i use that as a jumping off point to to ask questions about historically how have black women elders in particular um, those who are over 50, I just turned 50, right? Those who are over 70, age 70 and, and above, how have they written about stress management and self-care? And so Black women's yoga history emerged when I saw um, a picture of Rosa Parks doing yoga. And that for me really, you know, even as she was continuing her activism in Detroit and she lived to be age 92, it helped me understand that self-care is not, as we said at the beginning of the conversation, self-care is just not for other people. Self-care is not just, you know, it's perceived to be for um, not only white women, but if we're talking about class, right? If we're talking about class in the black community that, oh, that's what, you know, black women who are either well off or elite or want to be white, that's what that's that's who do like that's that's who take it you know that's the perception of what who does yoga, and if we look historically and if we look contemporarily, there are all sorts of different types and shapes and sizes and approaches to how Black women have done yoga, and um, and self care is part of activism. That's all you know. That's all that in that chapter in that uh, in Dr. Bell's chapter. That's what I found out you know throughout history. We all have, you know, we are human beings and human beings have different ways to heal. And we have those, we need to tap into those traditions. Absolutely. Dr. Bell? I know I'm not supposed to talk about Black women's yoga history, but I have to give it a shout out too, because um, mm -hmm. I, I used it in my, in my class, um, you know, this semester too. It was just, it was enlightening to see how many people didn't realize that we had a tradition of being still just like we have a tradition of being constantly busy. Yes, yes. And I think that that's what I think is really important about the book, that some of our solutions are outside of the box. Like I think that we we think about, you know, what can I do to relax? Okay, I'm gonna watch my TV show and just, you know what I'm saying? Like we, we there's like these, even when we take time for ourselves, we go back to the exact same toolbox sometimes. You know, sometimes we have to think beyond. What if just like not doing is my healing? Not plan a whole bunch of stuff to do. What about what if I just not did? I'm going to sit in a relaxing position and just focus on my breathing. Most of us would feel guilty about doing that, to be honest with you. Not only is it hard to do because of all our rheumative thoughts and then anxieties kick in, we would literally feel guilty about being still for a moment. Sometimes I feel judged when my Apple Watch is like, uh, just breathe. It's only asking me for one minute. I'm like, who are you telling to breathe? I got stuff to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, I can't take one minute. I cannot, I cannot spare 60 seconds for air to come in and out of my lungs for 60 seconds. No matter what you're doing, you have 60 seconds. And I mean, that's really, that's something, you know what I mean? And so I, I, what does remind me, even though I do feel judged by my Apple Watch, I, I also am reminded that these solutions don't have to be super deep. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it's not... Well, I can't afford or do I don't have time to take two weeks to the spa. Nobody is saying that those are those are the solutions. Sometimes the solutions are 60 minutes of breathing. Sometimes the solution is 10 minutes just just catching up with your girl. You know, what I mean, sometimes the solution is I'm going to be camera off on this Zoom meeting for a bit. And yeah. I'm just going to lean back here like this here. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sometimes the solutions are small but mighty. And I think we have to we have to think about that. We are probably the most spirit we are. We're definitely the most religious folk, right, in the United States, per, by far black women. And I think even beyond going beyond religion, I think we do need kind of spiritual rituals. Now, regardless of faith, I'm going outside of what I'm saying, organized religion, but something that just centers us. Get yeah. centered for a second. And yeah. have that be part of your daily routine. Somehow we lose that. Children do it. Oh God, yes. Children yes. pick times to just like mm -mm, I'm just doing me in this moment. You can see, you can watch them just have this moment. I'm going to be coloring and literally not even hear you for about ten minutes. 
check back <laughs> in. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we need to carve out that time without feeling guilty. We need to carve out that time without overthinking the time. You know what I'm saying? Over planning and overthinking it. The solutions really can be tangible and can be something that we can we can grasp and use in real life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Kwanda is talking about um, she's cracking up over your camera off and lean back. But also spending uh, time with That's you all about this. Um, about this topic is a part of my self-care and activism for today. And that's the other part, you know, you know, it's hard as a media scholar, and we actually have this, you know, many chapters in the book on social media, mm -hmm. health and all that. Um, you know, part of my job is to watch t television. It's not because I'm lazy, smart people, <laughs> or I'm not a critical Love thinker. You. Smart people. I'm not talking to y'all specifically. <laughs> you were like, oh my God, you watch so much TV. You seem so smart. He's awesome sometimes. I know I am smart. Thank you very much. Some of it is because I watch so much television. Um, but about part of my job, right? I'm a film and media scholar, right? Um, and I like film and media, quite frankly. Um, I make it, I create it also, right? Like this moment here that we're having. Um, but um, you know, even when I have to do that, I check out sometimes. You know, when I was talking to my mom earlier today, she was talking about the Ronald Green case, and I I literally had blocked it out of my head because I was mm -hmm. When I saw that the tape was being released, I said, oh, I can't watch this because I know how it's going to go. I didn't know how it was going to go. Right. You know, that's not a, what a journalist is supposed to say. But in my head as a black person who sees this all the time where it's like, OK, here we go. You know, it's like George Floyd, where people were just on pins and needles and so mm -hmm. stressed on that particular day of the verdict um, in terms of the Derek Chauvin trial. Um, but when I saw that the the they had the video they being the video had been made available i was like i can't watch that so i i literally uh went and watched which is not so much better law and order which i love um <laughs> i didn't watch the law and order marathon i watched roger moore mm -hmm. uh, last night i was watching um oh my gosh i was watching black exploitation films and i learned i was like this many years old when i learned that jonathan demi had written black mama white mama which is a horrible black exploitation film but with mm. Peter in it, yes, Travis and Demi, like the Academy Award winning uh, director. I did not know that either. And <laughs> no. I also have disdain for Black Mama, White Mama. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a horrible movie. I mean, it's not, <laughs> just watch that movie like, oh, this right. was allowed to be released. <laughs> yes, but I, I had to watch, I watched that. I watched Coffee, it was a, a channel called Movies, which I hadn't found um, before called Movies and they show a bunch of old movies. Um, mm -hmm. And those movies are now old, even though they're part of our childhood, they're officially, you know, like 40, 50 years old. Um, and so anyway, my point is that even with media, um, you have to pay attention to what you intake and what you digest. Um, and so even though those uh, those things I was watching, um, at Stuart Hall, Rest in Power, uh, a dynamic uh, uh, Black British um, scholar with Jamaican roots, um, writes about the ways in which we engage text, right? You can engage them like, oh, this is purely entertainment. Um, you can have a negotiated, and that's the perverted or dominant reading. Um, you have a ne negotiated or um, relationship where, you know, like when we watch reality television, you're like, oh my God, I'm horrified. They're making black women look terrible, but I can't stop watching. Uh, I treat that like a cartoon. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, and then there's oppositional where you're like, I can't watch this no more. I'll cut it off. So I had an oppositional experience with when they released this stuff. And as a journalist and as someone who covers race and gender and sexuality and intersectionality as my beat, I just needed a day off. So mm -hmm. I took it. Mm -hmm. So I want to give people permission to not engage in things that are going to traumatize you all the time. Turn off CNN. I mean, and I love CNN. Let me just go ahead and say that. My girl, Lisa Respers France, I, I'm putting up the Black Power sign right here. You can't see it. Um, that's my girl, um, uh, Don Lemon. You know, I rock I with her too. who work. Um, Denise Hendricks. I, I, I rock with a lot of people at, at CNN. Um, but that watching that loop, right? MSNBC, love it. Rachel Maddow. Yeah, the kitchen. Joy Reid, the readout. Oh my God, I love that show. But, you know, sometimes I just got to just, hit that pause button um, and just take some time for me. So I just wanted to say that because we hadn't really addressed media and I know that's my area and that's mm -hmm. a big part of our book too. Um, that, you know, you don't have to take in, I think that's what Kanika was saying as well as Stephanie, um, there are different ways of taking in information um, and there are different ways of um, protecting yourself. And when the world is not trying to protect you uh, by and large, you know, um, 
then there are things that you can do and they're small but mighty. Like, so turn off the TV is one of them, um, which you wouldn't think a media scholar would say, but I would say that. Taking, mm-hmm. um, I do what is called a social media fast. I used to do this with my students um, when I was at Coucher uh, College. I'm at Emory now, which I always forget to tell people. I'm a professor at Emory. Um, but when I was at Goucher, I used to make them do a uh, social media fast. And when I tell you the withdrawal alone. Right, was, how long were they able to do it? My students can't do it in class. I mean, this was like, you know, about during my class. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Mine either. Mine either. Can you fast for the 50 minutes that we're in class? Right. But I mean, these are students, but think about you. See, you know, uh, my dad always says my uh, phone is an extension of my hand. <laughs> He's mm. never seen me without a phone in my hand since they were, um, uh, uh, became available to the public, <laughs> which is probably true. But um, in saying that, you know, sometimes even I, I have a do not disturb. So when my do not mm-hmm. disturb gets on, it's over. If, you, and if you're dead, you're going to be dead the next day. I'm not going to know about it until the next day because my phone is off. Um, so those are different things that you can do. Um, and then I, uh, we have five more minutes, but I did want to say, Stephanie, can you talk about the Eastern philosophy root of yoga? Um, I know that we're in Georgia and people here have actually banned yoga in some public schools um, because they think it is uh, in religion. Yes, yeah, with uh, Christianity. Yeah, but can can you talk a little bit about the origins? Because we love to uh, pay homage to yes, yes. absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and I must say, I'm grateful to um, as we you know know that there's an imperative to hashtag cite Black women in this work. I hashtag cite Indian women. So um, Rupa Singh, Ramya Pucha, uh, Srina Gandhi are three Indian women scholars, South Asian women scholars of yoga who I not only cite their work, but you know, uh, engage them actively and appreciate their contributions. Um, but I'm actually looking at the African and African-American roots of yoga. So you mentioned you know, yoga is being banned in certain areas in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Well, we have, um, we have in Georgia a long history of you know, women like Jessie Norman from Macon, Georgia, who is an, uh, an opera singer who credited um, Hatha yoga with the ability to master her instrument, oh, to master breathing. And this, she was taught this at Howard University, yogic breathing, where you can exhale in a certain way that you're using your full lung capacity, you're using all of the instrument in your voice and exhale for, you know, with such force but without blowing out a candle that's right in front of you, right? And and uh, opera singers like Shirley Verrett talked about teaching Povarati, you know, ha- new yoga stretching, that's Hatha yoga, that's the physical aspects of yoga. But we also have women um, like um, uh, 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 um, Jan Willis, right? Who is at Agnes Scott as a professor, who is kind of merging that, she has a book called Black, Baptist and Buddhist, that she's black from Alabama and Baptist, but she has studied um, uh, Eastern religions, right? And so she is, she's at Agnes Scott as a professor right now. And so it's, it's again, like, it's a lot, I think should covers, covers the complexity and people just like to oversimplify and have their little 240, 280, 140 characters, whatever it is on Twitter. And, you know, and, and, and I love, you know, I love Twitter. I love Facebook. I'm, I'm a lurker. I don't post a lot, but I love to see, you know, it's, it's a beautiful arena for, for diverse voices, but um, we don't do that enough. And so you get this, like, we can't do yoga because it's a religious thing. It's like, well, y'all just clearly don't read. Right. right, for comprehension. And as someone who's right. also uh, Black um, and raised Baptist and who is a Buddhist, I study Buddhist philosophies, um, you know, I rock with Jan and all the great work that she's doing. Um, but you just need to find what works for you. And I also think um, one of my great friends, Miranda, said to me over the weekend, she said she used to have lots of anxiety. Um, she would have lots of um, uh, issues when she was minding other people's business. <laughs> So she says she stopped minding other people's business and her heartburn went away. You know, her anxiety disappeared and all those different things um, that happen. Um, so instead of minding other people's business, and I do this, say this as someone who studies Buddhist philosophies, 
Um, because people are always like, Oh my god, I can't believe it. Like you're a Buddhist or what have you. Um, yeah, I am, and I do study Buddhist philosophies, and they do calm and relax me. And chanting is uh really the best thing that has ever worked for me in terms of calming my mind, which is super active, and such is the case with dynamic uh women um like us, uh, who sometimes have to quiet the mind. Uh yes. But, but before uh, this will be the last thing I say, um, black women's yogahistory.net, blackwomensyogahistory.net has a lot of resources. So you can find your own flavor of yoga because everything like Jill, the philosopher Jill Scott has said, everything ain't for everybody, right? So find what works for you. Yoga is more than just the physical postures. It's the mind, body, and spirit. And there's a lot of different classes on YouTube. There's a lot of lectures, a lot of recommended reading, a lot of powerful uh, networks of black yoga teachers, black women yoga teachers. So there's a resource page on that website. That's a place to start and there's more to come. All right, and um, I'd like to thank you all for coming, Dr. Stephanie Evans, Dr. Kanika Bell. I'd like to end on this last note from Darlene McGee Whittington, who says, small, small but mighty solutions. I love that I won't feel guilty anymore about taking a moment for myself. So I feel like if our viewers um, understand that and our viewers appreciate what um, uh, Darlene is saying and what we have said today, then their lives will be much happier and that they will do um, better with dealing with the mental health um, issues or mental health, um, improving our mental health, which is what we're all striving for um, this month and every month of the year. So thank you for watching and we will see you next week.